Well, hello and welcome to this week's special edition of a Dividend Cafe podcast with our entire investment committee here to talk about the swoon in the markets taking place today around the so-called coronavirus and a lot to kind of unpack. We're going to try to go a little short today because all of us are in the midst of various portfolio activities and client uh, conversations and things like that, but we're taking a a moment to discuss it uh, amongst ourselves and record it all for you. So... First and foremost, let me just kind of get right down to it, though. The uh, rundown for those of you listening who maybe weren't paying attention to some of this in the news last week was that there were uh, isolated cases of the virus breaking out earlier in the week. Uh, By the end of the week, I believe as of Friday, that fatality number had gotten up to about 50. As I talk here today, it's now at about 80. Mm -hmm. And the number of reported cases is somewhere around 5,000. Um, there are five cases that they've been reported in, Cal- in uh, excuse me, the United States, two of which uh, they are not even sure it is coronavirus, um, and the other three of which they think they have reasonably controlled. Uh, so we're going to be talking about this as a Chinese market story um, and its impact on American financial markets. But as far as a health epidemic, it is not yet, and we would certainly pray it will not become so a U.S. centric story. So we talked last week, and I think rightly so, about the precedent with SARS back in 2003. There had been the avian swine flu uh, in 1999, and there had been other – the Ebola um, issue in 2013 or 14. So we've had these various health epidemics over the last 20 years, and uh, right now this is playing out exactly the way all of them have, which is some modest elevated volatility in the early stages. And then, of course, the part that we don't yet know – is the way that all these other epidemics ended, which is that they ended. Um, so I'm going to leave it open for discussion. I have a number of comments. I was uh, at the. I worked pretty hard this morning unpacking a lot of some research and so forth. And then I went to my morning workout in the middle of working out. NBC called and asked for uh, a quote on how it impact trade, and I'm uh, was really <laughs> breathing very heavily. And I think they probably thought I had the coronavirus as I was giving them an answer about the trade impact. (laughs) But I do want to get into the issues related to trade, the U.S.-China situation. But right now, just macro, broad impact. I'll start on my left with Dea, and we'll go around the circle. Um, What is your initial kind of instinct around this as a market event? Uh, my, my initial instinct around this is, and I'm heavily biased towards this being primarily uh, fear driven and mood of the market thing. And as far as, uh, yeah, the markets, uh, you know, sold, sold off a bit, treasuries have rallied, but the fear is almost always overblown. And when you look at the actual fundamentals and like David mentioned that we've had a lot of epidemics throughout, throughout the years, you have SARS, you have Ebola, you have, you have swine flu. Uh, I'm looking at this chart here, Asian flu, Hong Kong flu, and uh, and no doubt that they have some sort of effect on fundamentals in the short term, maybe uh, travel or certain commercial activities, but they tend to be exactly that short term in nature, and they're very hard to predict exactly how long they'll last. So trying to trade around uh, these epidemics has has proven uh, has proven to be extremely difficult, and will most likely cause you some sort of self inflicted harm. So uh, that that's uh, that's the way I see it. Yeah. Good yeah. feedback. Yeah, Ryan? I, I would agree with that. I, I think it's kind of uh, it's well. First off, it's hard to predict. Um, and actually, first and foremost, uh, you know, our thoughts are with the families of, of those that are affected by this thing. It's terrible. Um, as far as how it moves markets, it's moving them today, and it's fear based. Um, as far as it changing fundamentals in in the world, um, I think it'd be highly unlikely that that could happen. And if there was some wood, I would knock on it. Uh, unless it really were to get much worse. Um, so for now, we're kind of taking it day by day, and it's moving markets a little bit, one and a half percent on the day. Um, so we'll kind of yeah. take it as it comes. Julian, um, add, add a comment, and then I'm going to have a follow-up. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I was going to say it's interesting to put this number into perspective when you look at, you know, just the U.S., you have uh, 200,000 people a year who get diagnosed with influenza, and then 35,000 a year who, who die, and we don't talk about that. Mm. And so if you look at, you know, SARS in 2003, there was 700 people, 700, about 800 people died, and mostly in China. And, um, and uh, the, the, you know, the impact on the economy, actually, it's even, uh, even 10 years or 15 years later, it's, it's hard to know exactly what's the impact. I mean, you have numbers going from 30 billion to 100 billion globally, and some estimates saying that China lost about uh, 1% of GDP that year, and in Southeast Asia, it was about 0.5%. So I guess the impact 
in the US, US economy was really uh, marginal. Um, what happened, or even you know, the, the global economy, so maybe locally, clearly this could have an impact on the Chinese economy. But if it's comparable to SARS, it's probably not going to have much impact on the you know, overall economy. Mm-hmm. It's really the fear factor that's impacting, um, mm-hmm. that's impacting the economy more than but anything But fear else. of what? I mean, isn't that the point? It's fear, it's uncertainty. The thing we're afraid of is that we're afraid of something. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, is, it isn't definable or measurable or known. If it were, like let's say we're afraid of, of 80 deaths becoming f- f- uh, 50,000. Well, we have, we have that many deaths from influenza in the United States yeah. and then some now. It's just sort of, the, to me, this kind of undefinable uncertainty. I guess it's it's fear of uh, the unknown. So like people stop traveling, stop going on holidays, stop you know going to restaurants. They just stay home. They quarantine. I mean, you have like uh, in China. In China, yeah. But I guess the difference with like uh, Charles is that uh, these days you have many more people, you know, uh, uh, traveling, and you can see like the I think U.S. is trying to. uh, to get a thousand people back from Yuhan. I think France has like 500 people there. They're trying mm-hmm. to get back. So there's, I guess, much more interconnection with China these days than you had 15 years ago. So that's, I would bet that maybe the difference is going to be, you're not going to have 80% of the death toll of the, of the case in China. It's going to be probably more spread out, yeah. but the numbers are still, you know, very low. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and like you said, as far as the uncertainty goes, it's different than sure. Maybe something like influenza where there's a lot more deaths related to it. But we understand influenza where this is new and, you know, your imagination could run away with you. And, yeah, you know, maybe it's only 80 deaths now, but who's to say it can't be 800,000 deaths. And it's easy to see the fear kind of getting away with you where we don't really have that knowledge yet. Yeah, I think it's interesting, too, just to think about the size of the Chinese economy compared to what 15 years ago or 2003 and how the effect of something like this would have maybe a more more of a of, a, of an impact just because the Chinese economy is growing at 6 percent GDP versus, you know, 12 as it was in 2003 type mm-hmm. of thing. Well, plus, look how many more high speed trains are in China in that period of time, too. So what would previously have been more or less contained in just say Wuhan province city, what have you? I mean, the, people can get on a train during the incubation period and be in Bang, Beijing, Shanghai sure. in the same yeah. period of time. So. I, I just look at it as, you know, every every day the market's, you know, getting more volatile, a little, little dipping here and there. It just becomes a more compelling buying story, in my opinion. You know, we're, we're looking at this thing. We don't have data. The uncertainty is largely stemming from what the real or perceived uh, response is from the Chinese. You know, we had some kind of PR. I don't know if you guys saw the, the photo of all the excavators building that thousand person uh, hospital. I mean, r- miraculous, really. But I think we're, we're waiting to see whether or not they are transparent about what's actually happening M- over there. Miraculous, like how, how quickly well, they built Yeah, it. I mean, you, they did a great job. I have the, to give them they credit They extended for the Lunar yeah, New Year. Yeah, so that's it's good timing, yeah. I guess, in some respect. But yeah, the, the photo or video I'm looking at is in, in Wuhan, they're having trouble dealing with the, the outbreak, right? So they're building this mm. thousand-person bed uh, uh, from the bare dirt. And there were these photo uh, you know, and videos yeah, that yeah. showed dozens and dozens of excavators kind of looked like they're just moving sand and dirt from one place to another, but evidently it's going to be yeah. done in six days. Right. It's amazing it's how amazing. quickly they, yeah. can, they can put those yeah. type of structures up. Yeah. So, so if I have a theory that the greater um, magnitude of impact of a Chinese health epidemic to a global supply chain now versus 15 years ago um, it is a positive to this problem, not a negative would you guys uh, say I'm crazy? And what I mean by that is there are so many more people with skin in the game that are driven towards a solution, towards an immediate uh, transparent resolution, towards um, collaboration. You have South Korea, Thailand, uh, of course, United States, but you have significant Asian regional trading partners all on the ground there in China working together towards uh, containment, where um, I think that the known risks lead to pragmatic motive towards a uh, solution. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, there is a sense, um, what's the old joke? How many, uh, how many guys does it take to screw in a light bulb? Uh, who knows? Just ask the free market. It'll figure it out. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's really funny. That's a great, <laughs> that's a great, <laughs> great <laughs> and it's one of these jokes that like a few economists sit in a hotel room, like the, you get done with a conference and then you go out to the break room and the economists tell the joke and they all laugh. And, and there's just no girls around and there's no cool guys around. It's just economists <laughs> laughing at the joke. However, the joke is somewhat true. That is it possible? The way you should feel about this epidemic is that you do not know how it'll get worked out. You just know that it will get worked out. Is that is that fideism, blind faith, or is it actually the unbelievably clear lesson of history, Dave? It's the unbelievably clear lesson of history. 
Look, I, I'm not a uh, pathologist. I don't understand these diseases in and out, but I do understand the data. And if you look at the data, the, you know, people get together, they solve these problems, they and they find a solution to uh, these epidemics. Now, what, what David mentioned is the increased globalization of everything and uh, everybody getting together and, and, and trying to, and you have more of a collaborative effort in trying to solve these problems is definitely a plus. Obviously, if this you know, disease. Uh, I, I absolutely don't think it's uh, it, it's as serious as the media portrays it to be. But if like we're living in La La Land, let's say we're, the movie Outbreak, we're, we're thinking about the movie Outbreak. Yes, it would be a bad thing. It'd be better if there wasn't any sort of anybody who's connected and this happened in a single village was able to be contained. But we do live in a globalized economy, and people are able to work together to solve these problems. If you look at the historical record, it's absolutely clear these things tend to fix uh, tend to be fixed by uh, people who are intelligent, they tend to be fixed pretty quickly. I agree. I think with more people involved and more people connected, while the speed of an outbreak could maybe travel a little faster around the world, I right. think with more eyeballs and and people looking at it, uh, how to solve the problem, the the faster and, and the uh, the more efficient it will get solved. So, yeah, Julian, before you bring it up, I'm going to ask you because I don't really want to get into it. Do you think that the Fed is now looking at this as a potential catalyst? <laughs> we all knew he was going to go there anyway. The Fed. <laughs> yeah, I don't think uh, the, the Fed is really uh, focused on that too much, but I guess indirectly this is, I mean, you, you can see, you know, the 10 years starting to move a little bit, the dollars is moving. So, you know, 10 years back to 1.6, the curve has inverted slightly already, uh, slightly on the short end, uh, I think the last two weeks. So if you look at the implied probabilities, the market is already saying, you know, maybe nothing, you know, I guess based on the guidance of the Fed, you know, we believe nothing happens the first half of the year, but the implied probabilities are not really moving. But that doesn't move though. That, that, that percentage, the almost no possibility of uh, February, March cut yeah. and the higher this possibility of a July, August, September cut, that's been there since the holidays. Uh, yeah. So it's not, I don't like the... Specifically, the epidemic is not really. I don't think is is, uh, is doing anything to how uh, the Fed is thinking of the sh in the that, that would in the be short term. Low. That, that hasn't even moved long term rates no. really. I mean, a couple of basis points, right? No, not much. You know, yeah, not yeah. much. Yeah. But I guess what I'm saying is like if the odds are, you know, by December that uh, you know a f in the market expects a cut, you rarely see the Fed not following what you know the implied probabilities are. So we'll see. I mean, they can try to guide. Uh, the market a different way by by the time we get to that point, but at the moment, like the market is saying, we want a one or two rate cuts by the end of the year. I, I find it a little hard to to you know separate out the effect of this you know the coronavirus from some of the political stuff that's happening too. I mean, because it's coincident with you know Bernie rising in the polls a little mm -hmm. bit, this new Bolton book revelation too. So kind of unpacking the, the the market or the the macro effects has been a little bit hard for me personally. Just because of the confluence, it's all it's all happening kind of at the same time right okay, now, okay. right there. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, the, I, I think there's a couple of things that come up with these types of events that I've really seen it so many times now. It, it feels um, really redundant, and that is a market that needs no excuse to sell off. And and you had mentioned a moment ago, Brian, down 1.5%. The Dow is down at 1.500. It's down 1% now. It's down 300. Okay, mm -hmm. Now, by the time we're done recording, it could be back to 500 and the market could end flat on the day. I, I mean, that's literally the kind of craziness you get yeah. in, in the in this intraday volatility that we've had so little of in, uh, lately. But the market is up 3,000 points in the last three and a half months. Yeah, 3,000 points in the Dow mm. since phase one trade deal was announced. The market could literally have gone down 400 points today because of an outfit someone wore at the Grammys. I mean, that's it's just that random and that ridiculous to be. Able, now, I do believe this is related to coronavirus uh, sentiment, fear, volatility. All, all that that's where this happens to be. But if it wasn't this, it could very well have been something else. So then you look into the Fed and what they may or may not do, and you know, there's all the different factors. I think you're right. The shape of the yield curve is going to dictate what they end up doing later into the year. But but I guess. Um, I, I don't want to just give the message to our listeners, our clients, that is what so many others would be saying right now, which is ignore the noise, the media is full of it. But that's kind of my message. Like sometimes we're with consensus, and I'm with consensus. This is just noise. There isn't anything else to be talking about. The impeachment did not generate enough market activity to, to stimulate anybody. Um, you, you know, the real big news story right now in the world is a tragedy, not a market impacting one, which is the death of the icon who is Kobe Bryant. 
they're, they're not going to talk about that all day on financial media. So, so this is the story. But, but I'm not belittling this as a story. I'm just saying, do you guys get an impression that there's almost kind of glee from the press that they have a chance to generate a little bit of fear and hype when they haven't had that opportunity for a bit, Brian? Yeah, no, I, I definitely think that, unfortunately. You know, they're, they're in the business to sell advertising, and you get more eyeballs watching the screen and you get, get more ad revenue. And so they're sensationalistic and, and you know, uh, a motive to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but, like, you know, and I, I totally agree. I, I think we are consensus on this, which is that it's terrible, it's tragic. We're going to deal with it as it comes. It's not changing fundamentals, and it and to use Fed speak, it will likely be transitory. <laughs> you know, it's, it's something that will come and go, and, and we'll move on. Yeah. Uh, Dan, what were you going to say? No, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's it almost sounds a little boring. Um, I, I mean, I wish that it, that we could say that, wow, this time is different, and here is exactly why this time is different, and so on and so forth. It'd probably make for a more interesting discussion. But all we can really look at is the historical record and uh, and go from there as far as, as our analysis goes. So, I think that uh, this this report, uh, Lewis Gov at GovCal Research, that uh, we circulated real early this morning. He's one of my favorite economists, and his father, Charles, is perhaps my very favorite economist living right now. Um, his point about China having two speeds on this stuff is really interesting. Mm -hmm. Either total cover-up, sweep under the rug, see no evil, hear no evil, <laughs> or this like substantial overreaction where right now, and I didn't realize this, they're attempting to mm -hmm. quarantine 50 <laughs> 56 <laughs> million people, which is the population yeah. of Italy. Yeah. Um, but boy, is that ever different than the SARS thing in 2003? Just yeah. a completely yeah, yeah. different response. Yeah. No, no, I, I don't know. Uh, and as far as uh, those are just a few different cities or the city of... Uh, it's a, I think surrounding it's, it's the UN yeah. uh, province. So uh, yeah. uh, when they say quarantine, that means nobody's being like, let out of the city. Well, that's that's the travel. weird thing is like no, the, the, you're not allowed to leave, but then France, U.S., they're all trying to get their expats out of there. So it's like, well, okay, well, so what's gonna, the point quarantining 53 million people if you're well, like a thousand French they're people? They're going to pull out them out and quarantine them in country, though. So like if the French or whoever else is pulling their people, they're going to quarantine them. Yeah, they're going to quarantine you know, so yeah. okay. they'd be quarantined in the U.S. Period, yeah. yeah, it's like traveling for with 15 days. So right. they would right. pull them out and get them to a hospital in France and quarantine or, or them wherever. There. Yeah, that's yeah. the that's the that's idea. The plan. Yeah. That's the idea. Might right. it? Might this also just thinking through the trade deal stuff? You know, we, we talked previously about the maybe unbelievable nature of the pr proposed agricultural purchases from yeah. from China. And I don't I don't at all mean to be culturally insensitive, but if people are over there eating. Bats, cats, and rats. Don't you? Well, think hold on. Is that true? Is that true? This is. Bison I'm reading. I'm yeah, reading. I want to make sure we're not offensive. So no, I'm just no. going to read from the report. Yes. What he's saying is that the current Wuhan flu has been blamed variously on bat soup, rat meat, and even consumption of cobras. Yeah. And so I, I don't know differently. I, I was unaware of what they believe causation to be, but obviously. That you is that where you're going no, with this? No, maybe just, this would speak to the fact they need U.S. Exactly, agriculture? that's exactly where I'm going with it. Or because modernity, they're, because they're, one of the two, perhaps they're coming off of that 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 swine flu, right, where they had a shortage of pork in the country. So what I'm saying is, maybe people are choosing a substitute protein or something like that, and they went maybe a little too far in some situations. So I don't know. I, I don't know. It's kind it's, of we don't know from the reports necessarily, but. I thought it was I mean, just like a specialized market well, in Wuhan where it they, be, it's like, uh, I mean, a lot of these things is that where it like originated? A, yeah. delicacies or so, I, I don't know. Maybe it's, yeah, I've I've seen I think to Robert's too, point, this, yeah. if anything, it's either a non-event or if anything on the margin, it might incentivize greater right. importing of that's, U.S. That's what I'm going for. Yeah, I could go Product yeah. and, and way of life. <laughs> right. be a so, but remember could, the could be a derivative, I guess. We can't yeah. talk about the superiority of Western civilization on this podcast. That's not what we're here for. It's, not, it's just this is just a cultural thing, and it's a cultural thing. Yeah. But it has a health ramification. It does, and it so does. Uh, it's worthy of noting. But the media uh, coverage yeah. is the most, I think, interesting thing about the, about the you know the these um, epidemics because it, it, it goes back to human nature. Is like why do they why do they talk about this so much on the news? Is because you know we that's how they catch our attention, and like we like why do, why do bank negative. robbers rob banks? Because that's where the money is. Yeah. So why does the media put this stuff out exactly. there? Because the people want to hear it. So they yeah. like to hear about that, and they like to hear about bad news and scary stuff more than yeah. right. And, and, what's, and what's scarier than dying from some exactly. unknown disease? Yeah, but see, I, I make a distinction, yeah. Julian, between financial media and and the regular press, the tabloids, oh, yeah. presenting this as sort of a story about disease and hospitals and quarantines and bat soup and stuff. I get why that is a shock value thing, just like at People Magazine or, or the Nightly News, mm -hmm. even. But I'm saying specific to investor ramifications. 
it, it concedes a certain short-termism, which is fatal to investor success, and it doesn't even do that very well. They mm -hmm. don't even get the short-term ramifications right. So I would I would kind of argue that I'm not. Sh I think the reason people care about short term is because the media is telling them to care uh, in mm -hmm. an investor mm -hmm. context. Mm -hmm. They care about short term because the media is telling them to care about short term. It is entirely possible that we had an outbreak of health epidemic in another country with other ramifications that we would never even know about, and markets would never have gone down. It would not impact tourism. It would not impact, you know, direct commodity purchases and so forth. I think that it's the the self-fulfilling prophecy mm -hmm. here yeah. that is really, I think, very problematic and, and irresponsible. Irres well, it creates opportunities right. for long-term investors as it well. Does. So we should yeah. see that it as does. a blessing. It does. And, and, and it, also, it also reinforces the moral validity of our profession. Okay? Like people, mm. if, you, if your advisor is an anchor on, on a financial news network and you're reading all this and seeing all of it, you might think the right thing to do. I'm not panicking. I'm not being crazy. I'm being smart. They're saying that this could shut down tourism and take out a third of a continent, and I got to go sell everything my four hundred one k for a little while. And they and 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 so the intermediary who is a financial a, a good financial advisor is the one who has to sit there to say, I don't know exactly how it's going to end or when. I do know that's the dumbest thing you could possibly sure. do. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, Brian, you you could yeah. think about other things even outside of SARS over the years, other non health epidemic issues. But isn't that kind of always the case where short-term volatility, when played into, instead of becoming your friend, becomes your foe? It is. And, you know, it's not that it's ignored and that that's the answer every single time. There are things that happen in the world that change that change things, you know, that, that change fundamentals. But when you have something like, unfortunately, and, and it's tragic, you know, 80 deaths out of uh, 1.4 billion people, it's unfortunate. But is that changing the way the world turns? Is this the end of humanity as we know it? Uh, no. And, and and so we'll we'll find a solution to it one way or the other, and, and it'll play out, and, and we'll move on. And it just doesn't move. It doesn't make sense to make, you know, drastic, reckless decisions in your portfolio because of something that that is tragic and something that is scary like this. Yeah, which is basically something we could say all of the time that there is not ever really a, a event that um, it makes sense to be reckless. Sure. And and I guess I could I could take the other side of it though too. I don't see any of us saying let's go buy with both hands over a three or four hundred point drop in the Dow either. Yeah. So just like we have uh, always resisted panic selling, I'm not really tempted to panic buying right now either. No. I mean, what, so everything before today was eighteen point three x, and now it's eighteen point two x. Yeah, it hasn't moved much at all. Yeah. And like you like you said, what are we two percent from the high? Although you know. I, Energy might be getting even cheaper. It's cheap. <laughs> uh, the oil prices. I mean, again, I people is oil prices. Our oil prices down because of this flu, this epidemic. I, I don't believe it. I don't. I just no. Don't I mean, there's it. a there's a huge travel schedule in China right now. It just happens to be sort of their New Year on January 30th. But like the we lunar, were the lunar the lunar yeah, New Year. Yeah, yeah. And like you were talking about how they can build a hospital like oh, that yeah. with a thousand beds overnight. They also, and I just think it's fascinating. They extended the New Year to February second. Yeah, I read that. I mean, just with a decision like that, so to try to mitigate the uh, people, you know, not traveling and all that kind of stuff. So, well, it doesn't sound like any of us are particularly concerned about short-term trade disruptions. I think Robert's point that maybe there might be some anecdotal support for the need for greater imports of U.S. Uh, product. Um, but we do see today it hitting some of the key companies in the technology sector. But, of course, those companies have been up so much in the last couple months that it's really hard to say, oh, wow, people want less semiconductors or less, um, what's the word, smartphone products uh, just as a result of this. Um, so, you know, it's going to carry through where you would logically expect it to. But in terms of earnings season, we're in the meatiest week of the year of the quarter for earnings season this week and then again into next week. Uh one month from now, Robert, what will have moved markets more, the way earnings play out or this uh, health virus issue? Uh, earnings. Julian? Yeah, to earnings totally. I mean, I, it's uh, actually interesting that in the next few days and next week, it's extremely busy with earnings. So it's going to help us refocus on, on that. And I'm sure even the financial media are going to, you know, talk a bit less about this is could be, you know, this is interesting for a few days and then people get bored. And so they're going to go back to what makes more sense, hopefully, and earnings. And we have a lot of companies reporting. I think we have a half of our, 
companies reporting this week, so it's going to be very busy Wednesday to Friday. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree. Earnings or uh, or coronavirus? Definitely earnings and definitely fundamentals of those earnings. Is this going to hurt Corona beer that the virus is? I thought about that. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Well, how did he pick the name? Why Corona? I, I don't know. It, it, it's part of the I, the fam the the family. Is that not a trademark for Corona? Or, oh, the, fir, the fir ground zero <laughs> well, no, of the thing. The, uh, I I I I'm not because it's the way the, I don't want to. It's the way the virus so has correct. like some structure. Looks okay, like a okay. Corona. Oh, it looks like it. Yeah, okay, yeah. okay. And so. SARS is similar. It's all. I think something it's something like similar that. families. Okay. I guess. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and about a month. Look, I don't know what's going to move markets in a month. I know that earnings is what should move markets, and the longer that window gets, I my vote goes towards earnings. But look, if this death toll goes from 80 to – if this is still a story, which I, I I doubt it'll be still a story a month from now. But if it is still a story, it, yeah, it could it could cause some volatility in markets. Uh, Self-fulfilling prophecy sort right, of thing. Right, just like yeah. David was saying, the whole fear – you know, whether or not it's actually funding fundamentals, the whole self-fulfilling prophecy fear and, you know, maybe lead to more of a sell-off and tre- treasuries will continue to rally. So in a month, uh, it's it's a very short term window. I think earnings should drive markets in a, in a month. <laughs> and put, month. and I think your point, Julian, earlier was really good too, which is the flu in the U.S. alone, one country, thirty five thousand deaths every year, two hundred thousand hospitalizations, you know? thirty five thousand deaths. This, I did not know it, that. It puts it in comparison. So we should probably all stop traveling and stay home. No, it's dangerous to live. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's like the conclusion, right? Yeah. We should. I mean, it's it's down to if people change their habits. Then it will impact the economy. If they don't, then it will. You know, it's no not going to make a difference. No one's changing their habits. No. So no one's changing their habits on this. It's not going to happen. Th- th- this too shall pass. That's even when it ha- yeah, about. even even if it, they change their habits, it'll be a delay. Not I, I just earthquakes, tornadoes, terrorism, disease. Uh, the human spirit wants to live the flourishing life it wants to live, and if that means going to your favorite bat soup restaurant, I guess that's what we were going to do. Well, listen. That's not what this is not about U.S. tourism to China. It's about activity within China domestically. So, so th- I think the lowest hanging fruit of problems would come from if there was a legitimate and sustainable supply disruption. Even if there's a supply chain disruption in tech, it's not. If it's not sustainable, it's not a market moving event. It's just a hiccup. It's yeah. a pause. It's a delay. It's a you know these are things that are part of the system. And this is where like all the reading I've done of Talib over the years on anti fragility. I, I, systems get stronger when they get challenged and choked by kind of unexpected things like this. They become more robust out of it. And I think that you're, you're, it's very entirely possible we're going to look at this in a week or two and mourn for those who lost. You know, there is a real sickness and pestilence to, element here that's awful. But it may very well be we say, God, we've come, they've come a long way in what's essentially a third world country in 15 years versus where they were with SARS. Mm-hmm. And, and and the global cooperation, having South Korean doctors come in and th- things like this. I mean, that's it, that's where I expect it's going to go. I just think that we're in a uh, we're so conditioned to focus on the negatives, and there's some positive angles there. Mm. That in the midst of a market drop and and uncertainty around the the medical, I get why it's not ready to you know uh, be considered over yet, but it will be. And also, one big difference, I was listening on the, coming in today on the radio, uh, some of the biggest tech companies in China, uh, maybe it's it, for manufacturing might be a problem if you have a factory, but the tech companies, they just, all their employees just work from home. So it's like they keep, you know, they keep operating. Maybe you couldn't do that 20 years ago, but, uh, you know, if we all had to work from home tomorrow, you can, the business still can keep going on. Well, it's a good point. And I mean, uh, it's not going to impact your, uh, you know, the economy. It probably has less of an impact than it did 15 years ago as far as people not traveling mm-hmm. be, or, or not being able to go to work and things like that. Because you're right, with technology, you can now do it in other places. Yeah, remotely. Um, well, let's see. Is there anything else we need to cover? Does anyone have any kind of closing comments and then I'll sort of wrap us up? I think we've covered yeah, it. I think, yeah. I think we have too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah sorry. I will not... say this. If I hear one company in the earnings results that we still have to go, <laughs> blame, about the say, say we got to talk down forward guidance <laughs> because... and blame it on this, then I, I will. I'd be shocked. Uh, well, I won't be shocked. I, I can see it happening. Uh, Dale will be getting a task to uh, no. oh, <laughs> li- li- liquidate that position. That's very likely. <laughs> very likely. Uh, but, you know, you see that time to time. Companies are notorious for blame casting around, you know, yeah, current yeah, events. Cur- yeah. All yeah, right. Of currency, too. Any sort of... Any, any any sort of currency yeah, they movement do that. anywhere, yeah, it's right. all currency. So it's only one directional. Yeah, yeah. They never made their numbers because of currency headwinds. Right, exactly. yeah, yeah. They missed their numbers because <laughs> exactly. of currency headwinds. 
Um, it's a it's a you know tricky little time here. This is what we are paid to do. We're trying to get it right. We're trying to give you the right information. Trying to give you the right emotional construct to be thinking about this. And then from the economic side, standing and from the investment allocation, you can rest assured that we would be responding where we need to respond and not responding where we don't. And right now we're in a, a sort of don't just do something but stand there um, kind of approach. But the, the time may very well come where we get the opportunity to buy more. We just conducted a rebalance. We feel very confident that we have our client portfolios allocated the right way. There may very well be an opportunity to deploy some cash at lower prices um, and nibble in as we uh, target risk asset allocation gets a bit cheaper. But we don't know where that will go exactly. Um, markets are still up on the month of January, so let's be very sanguine about how we're interpreting a 1% down day. And they say the market was it was down last week, worst week in like uh, however many weeks while the market had been on a tear. So yeah, um, this is why you own bonds, this is why you own alternatives, because the day-to-day and month-to-month volatility sometimes can be disruptive. These things are reasonably neutered for a properly allocated portfolio. And then ultimately, we are focused on the greater good of earnings season. And there, you're going to hear a lot more from us about that stuff in the weeks to come. Um, I will not go down the path of talking about impeachment right now, but we may have more to say about that uh, by the end of the week in the politics and money section of Dividend Cafe. And to the extent I'm going to say anything at all about the tragic loss of Kobe Bryant and several of the people who are on the plane with him who are fellow Orange County residents here where the Bonson Group is located in Newport Beach, uh, there is an incredible loss in our community, incredible loss in the Southland. But I honestly, without being melodramatic, think it's an incredible loss for the whole country. But it's such a young and talented man with a family, a beautiful daughter. A lot of people not only lost a hero and a basketball legend yesterday, but a few people lost a father, and it's incomprehensible. So we uh, we give that proper um, mention to the events uh frankly, more on my mind than anything else. With that said, thank you for listening to our weekly Dividend Cafe, the special edition. Feel free to share it around as you see fit and reach out to us with any questions. And for clients, reach out to your private wealth advisor if there's anything else he can unpack, he or she can unpack for you in this time. Thank you very much. 